Welcome back, everybody, to our uh, weekly FSI seminar on COVID and. Um, we have, we're on our third week now. We had C uh, SHP do the first one. CDDRL was last week. And this week, we're moving over to CSAC, um, where Colin Call, uh, one of the co-directors, will uh, moderate our discussion and introduce our panelists. So over to you, Colin. Great. Uh, thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. I'm Colin Call. I'm the Social Science Co-Director at CSAC. Uh, thank you for taking time um, out of quarantine to uh, spend some time with us. Um, the coronavirus pandemic intersects with a number of research threads at CSAC, the Center for International Security and Cooperation at FSI, including uh, the study of existential risk, biosecurity, and issues related to geopolitics and foreign policy. Today, we have five CSAC faculty uh, who will provide brief remarks on various aspects of the current crisis through a security lens uh, broadly defined. First, uh, Steve Luby will discuss how high-income country responses to COVID-19 outbreaks in low-income countries may impact long-term collaboration on a global health security agenda. Then uh, David Relman will discuss some of the many US national vulnerabilities that have been revealed by our response to the current pandemic, how these vulnerabilities could be exploited by our adversaries, and how we might learn from this experience to prevent and prepare for the next pandemic. Then uh, Megan Palmer will discuss how the pandemic might impact biosecurity priorities and plans, including the management of research involving potential pandemic pathogens. We'll then shift gears uh, to uh, the international politics of the crisis and the role of the United States. I will step out of my moderator role and say some things uh, about the possible ways in which COVID-19 could intersect to make geopolitics uh, more conflictual and less cooperative. And then finally, Brett McGurk uh, will discuss the need to form an international coalition, building on our experiences of doing so to address other transnational challenges. So with that, um, Steve, I'd ask you to kick things off. And thanks again, everybody. Thanks a lot, Colin, and uh, welcome everybody um, to this conversation during this difficult time. So I'm a physician um, who's worked my entire career in global health, and global health really has two different conceptualizations. One idea of global health is that it's a humanitarian enterprise that we are interested in reinforcing common humanity, that our core value is social justice. And the real aim here is to improve health in poor communities. This humanitarian strain in global health, um, really the dominant strain, priorita prioritizes neglected diseases that afflict poor communities. And a humanitarian approach often recognizes that particularly in weak states, they're not able to um, deliver essential health services. And so there's a feeling that those who have resources even have an obligation to try to work within these difficult contexts. So when we think about the humanitarian um, thread of global health, we tend to think of um, non-governmental organizations like the Gates Foundation. But that conceptualization is a little overly simplistic because in fact, the US government has a strong humanitarian um, ethos as well in their global health work. Um, the biggest example would be um, George W. Bush's um, initiated PEPFAR program, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, this was deployed in 50 countries, um, over $80 billion since 2003, with reasonable estimates that on the order of 17 million lives have been saved through PEPFAR. Similarly, um, Bush, um, launched the president's malaria program, uh, again, $500 million since 2010, and really thought to be responsible for um, part of the 60% reduction in deaths due to malaria globally. So humanitarianism is a strong strain in global health. And in fact, within the US government is seen as global health diplomacy. Let's offer something to weak states, and there's a reason then that we have some trust and can move forward. By contrast, when we think about COVID-19, this tends to be thought through more of a global health security lens. So global health security recognizes that emerging infectious diseases don't need a passport. They go from one place to another, and state management of infectious disease is not a solely national concern. It actually matters what happens at wet markets in China. And therefore, we need mechanisms to develop capacity within states to conduct surveillance and response 
and we need mechanisms to coordinate this globally. So the US Centers for Disease Control with support from the Department of State, Department of Defense, World Health Organizations, GORN, that is the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, all advance this agenda, this global health security agenda. But it turns out that the global health security agenda is more controversial in many countries than is the humanitarian agenda. Um, to make um, progress in these infectious diseases, it's very important that we get hold of the strains so we can understand what the bug is that is causing this. And in Indonesia, which really was ground zero for a dangerous strains of influenza in 2005 to 2007, H5N1, they um, refused to share the strains. After an Australian manufacturer developed a vaccine based on an Indonesian strain and didn't offer the vaccine at an affordable price, nor any compensation to Indonesia. And the government of Indonesia made what many people consider a fairly strong argument that um, this is not just um, and began to assert an idea of viral sovereignty. That is, if a virus came out of that country, um, then it was sovereign property. So there have been years of negotiation over this. And finally, in 2011, there was a new agreement reached. But sharing remains voluntary. A number of shared, strains shared peaked in 2013 and has fallen by half since. Another narrative, for example, coming out of the Democratic Republic of Congo and the conflicts um, over some of the intervention there is that um, the outsiders are coming in treating Ebola because they're worried about Ebola. In fact, our bigger problems are malaria and measles. So at worst, then, um, this agenda really distracts low-income country governments from their highest priorities and their biggest needs. And it takes some of their most skilled people away to work on what are greater concerns for high-income countries. It risks sounding like a neocolonial agenda. And I anticipate this will continue to be a, a contested area in the years to come. So in some sense, we're being tested now during COVID-19, how are we responding to countries' needs? How are we looking? So let me just give you a little example from my lab. We have a, um, we're working in Liberia. Liberia is among the poorest countries in the world. Two bloody civil wars since 1999, um, lots of child soldiers being used, 500,000 deaths, ravaged by the Ebola outbreak in 2014 to 16, worsening corruption and lack of trust. We have a project that we're working on with the US Navy designed to reduce the risk of hospital transmission of infectious disease through improving hand washing facilities. We're a skilled group, funded, skilled postdoctoral scholar, on the ground, working with people in Liberia, going from hospital to hospital, and we're ordered to evacuate by the ambassador of Liberia. And the reason was because the US government doesn't want the responsibility that someone there might, an American citizen under um, US government authority might get COVID-19. So I think one of the lessons that the government of Liberia learned was that when COVID-19 came, the Americans will leave. Um, similarly, there was a big exodus out of, um, out of Bangladesh, um, but fortunately we were able to keep one person there. So I would just say, if we're going to address these great crises of, the of our times, it's not only our soldiers who will need to bear risk, we actually need to be in country working with people on these issues, and there's actually a lot that can be done. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, David? Thanks, Colin. Um, I'll just say I too am an infectious disease physician and a microbiologist, and I'm interested in how we might anticipate and plan for future biological threats. Um, as backdrop, let me just say that for 20 or 30 years now, um, much has been discussed and much has been written about the biological threats or the risks that we face here in the United States and that are faced by the rest of the world. There's been a fair bit of discussion about the importance of planning for events like this current one, um, the importance of a strategy for biodefense, and the importance of response capabilities. 
Many have also assessed in the last decade or two the preparedness profile of the United States and frankly have found it lacking in a number of areas, leading some to predict dire or even catastrophic consequences for this country under a variety of scenarios. Um, and I could refer and we could discuss some of these reports. But I think it's clear now that many of those predictions have in fact proven true. And what I'd like to focus on now are um, a few of the problems that have been called out that perhaps um, were not fully recognized as um, important or sufficiently important to deserve the kind of attention that they should have received. So I wanna do so by posing three questions. The first is, um, what are some of the most important but less well anticipated vulnerabilities that have been revealed by this pandemic? Um, the first vulnerability I would say is um, a state of poor situational awareness. We, in essence, don't know where the virus is, we don't know how it's being transmitted, and we don't know how quickly it is being transmitted. So these are um, pretty important questions, and this issue of situational awareness turns out to be important in a variety of settings. One is the global setting. We and others, including the Chinese, knew um, very little about the early days of this virus in the human population. Um, we know less than the Chinese, um, we think, about when it exactly began, or when it first showed up in humans, and what might have been some of the clues about its origin. And those um, questions about the origin of this virus remain very unclear to this day. Um, and I think our colleague Megan Palmer will touch a little bit upon this. But I wanna focus um, with respect to this vulnerability on what we knew and didn't know in the United States and still don't know. We, in fact, had no idea until well after the fact that the virus had arrived in this country. There were, as it turns out, a number of flawed assumptions about the effectiveness of our sentinel surveillance systems and of the um, usefulness of what we call syndromic surveillance. Our testing um, capabilities turn out to have been far less capable than we had thought or were led to believe. Um, we, in, in essence, had no pre-positioned platforms or coordinated approach. The CDC laboratory response network was almost completely unprepared for an event like this and was, in essence, outrun by the virus. As a consequence, we have relied upon surveillance of of syndromic features, the, the picture, the clinical picture of this illness, which we know, especially now, is terribly insensitive when um, some of the most important events in a pandemic like this are taking place um, from and between asymptomatic individuals. There is no syndrome to look for. So in essence, syndromic surveillance goes out the window when the agent is transmitted from asymptomatic individuals. And that leads to great uncertainty about where the virus is, who is infected, who is contagious, and then the subsequent secondary destabilizing effects of that uncertainty. The second vulnerability is our slowness to respond, the, the sluggish nature of our response system. This virus has shown again that the two most impor important properties of biological threat are pathogenicity and transmissibility. But this event makes very clear that of those two, transmissibility is the one that trumps the other, if you pardon the, the pun. Um, a fast moving agent with modest fatality rates ends up exerting a far greater global disruptive effect than a poorly transmissible but much more fatal agent. And this, again, underscores the importance of situational awareness and of rapid acquisition of situational awareness. The third vulnerability is the fragile supply chain. Again, we understood that there might be a problem here, but I think what we failed to understand adequately was that even with a limited prepositioned capability in, in supplies, critical supplies, we're actually quite slow at ramping up and scaling up the production of the, the missing resources. The fourth vulnerability that I'll mention is a leadership problem. Um, 
we again had recognized a fragmented leadership system for biodefense in this country, but in the current regime, it is clear that the capabilities of individuals um, and their lack thereof, coupled with a, a flawed structure, leads to fairly important and again, dire consequences. And, um, and there's more to be said about this. Finally, the fifth vulnerability is our patchy and fragmented public health system. It's that way by design and has certain important benefits perhaps in being so, but in situations like this, that kind of structure again reveals um, a vulnerability that lends itself to um, a susceptibility to misinformation, to exploitation by others. So that leads to my second question, how can these vulnerabilities be exploited? I'll just say very briefly in two basic ways. Poor situational awareness leads to the opportunity by others to essentially game and hack what it is that we barely know and recognize. One can certainly um, introduce misinformation or so disinformation and further cripple our trust or understanding of what it is we think we know or what we believe our leaders or our public health system knows. But from a more deliberate and perhaps nefarious point of view, there's a huge opportunity here in my view for someone to deliberately further disseminate the current agent if they chose to do so and, much, uh, and, and, and create much greater uh, disruption and, um, and crippling of our healthcare system um, by masking their efforts in the uncertainty that we have about what's actually going on. The other basic form of exploitation might, for example, target this fragile supply chain that I talked about, where one could easily deliberately disrupt the weakest links in that chain now revealed, um, as well as perhaps couple this deliberate dissemination or release of an agent with a pre-planned targeting of those critical resources that you know will be called upon in that scenario. So finally, third, how might we learn from these newly revealed vulnerabilities? First, um, we now understand, I think, much better the importance of surveillance and detection capabilities. We now need to think about how do we forward deploy those capabilities without knowing about the exact agent so that we're able to respond much more quickly there's more to be said here. Um, second, we need to think about perhaps a PR campaign that promotes a better understanding of how our public health system is set up, how it's meant to work, the value that it provides when you don't see those values. I mean, essentially, a great public health system is one that you don't ever see because it's prevented things that have never taken place. But that value has... Oh, I think we may have lost David there leadership system um, uh, look like. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I think, again, there's more to be said about how to build um, an effective but integrated leadership system for biodefense in this country. So, thanks. Thanks, David. Um, I would also encourage, we're, we're starting to get questions in the Q&A, but if you, have, um, if you have questions for our speakers, please click on the Q&A button and type your question and I will collect them and uh, ask our, our speakers at the end. But Megan, on to you. Great, thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm a biological engineer by training, but I've spent more than eight years now working with CSAC in a variety of capacities as an affiliate, fellow and senior research scholar co-leading efforts on, on biosecurity with FSI. And I just moved to a new role with the bioengineering department where I'm continuing to work with CSAC as well as partners both across and beyond the university um, on initiatives to ensure that the future of biological sciences and engineering is one that makes us more secure and, and not more vulnerable. And that's what I'd like to focus on today. How do we manage these increasingly powerful capacities to understand and manipulate biological systems as part of our biosecurity strategy. So we now see that we're relying on biological innovations to deliver the types of diagnostics, vaccines, therapies needed to respond to this pandemic. And we will need these innovations to prepare for future biological threats that may look, as David said, very different than the ones we're seeing today. And ultimately, the smartest strategy is to try and prevent these pandemics before they start. But there is an inherent conundrum 
some research designed to prevent and prepare for pandemics may risk generating the very types of threats that it risked it seeks to mitigate uh, by either accidents or intentional threats. For exa example, we're now seeing speculations that the origins of the pandemic could have involved accidents either in laboratory research or in field-based research on coronaviruses. Just how risky is this research? How beneficial? How do we reduce its inherent risks? Are the risks worth the benefits and the costs? These are long-standing questions and we frankly don't have very good answers. Um, we won't have certainty, we shouldn't expect to have certainty, but we could have, in many cases, much more confidence. Um, this pandemic will change our risk perceptions, and then there's a question about how it should change our priorities and our plans going forward. And I personally think that one key priority should be investing in smarter systems so that we can learn to manage this evolving risk landscape and reduce the chance of being surprised again. Um, the next pandemic, and there will we others could be even more devastating through many of the means that, that David highlighted. Um, I thought it'd be useful to share some recent events that are adjacent to this pandemic, but quite relevant. So in January, the National Scientific Advisory Board on Biosecurity, the NSABB, of which David used to sit, met to discuss oversight policies on pathogens of pandemic potential, like the research that is now in question. As the process of, in the process of developing these policies, the US government had actually commissioned a comprehensive risk benefit analysis that took a year, a million dollars and generated a thousand pages of report. Um, and they revealed in many cases that we really do lack an evidence base to make informed decisions, to make informed decisions about risk management. And they also identified um, several data, uh, types of data and systems that could help like collecting information um, on near misses and safety practices and what we can do to, to manage an inherently you know, risky en enterprise in, in learning about pathogens. But despite calls to support such data collection and sharing um, and the applied research around it, these have largely not been supported in practice as part of our biosecurity strategy. And there's now consequences even today um, uh, it, as we respond in this moment. Um, we're uncertain about exactly what the risks are, even in the best of certain cases around uh, conducting some such work. And it, that could be used to inform the scale of, of the research that's appropriate. And we're seeing a huge growth in the number of labs that are now working with coronavirus. How do we ensure that this work doesn't add to the risk landscape? And I get questions all the time from groups that are trying to ascertain, do I fulfill orders? How do I equip my lab? How do I oversee a lab that is now doing this work? Um, and I had an op-ed in Science and, and co-authored a piece with many other colleagues um, just last week that discussed the need to invest in both research and the types of, of forums to share practices so we can improve our practices over time and they don't backfire by creating new risks and threats that could be even more devastating. So how do we respond today? As David mentioned, we ultimately need to confront a reality where there is very likely to be continued uncertainty about the origins of the pandemic and future pandemics and the forms they may take. And we need to learn to act in the midst of this uncertainty I think we need to do several things. Um, we need a careful process of investigating origins, knowing that we may never know for sure. And there, um, unless there are some types of, of communication that point directly to some sort of accident, we can't be sure. Um, there are real limits to attribution and information is likely to be obscured even if it exists. Um, we need to manage the risks of misinformation and, and political pressures to arrive at, at uncertainty that doesn't, or a certainty that does not not exist. Um, and to go beyond this pandemic, we need to be reinvesting in a multifaceted strategy that reduces threats, threats through both prevention and preparation. Um, this means investing in platforms that can detect and respond to many threats, not just a single threat. Um, we need to reduce the risk that we know we can reduce, including in both field-based work and in labs, and in situations where we know there are increased risks of human-animal transmission. Um, we can't manage all risks, but we have capacities and we can develop tools to, to manage certain risks. And we must reinvest in our commitments to ultimate prevention around um, biological weapons threats and intentional threats, and of course, a strong healthcare system. And through this all, uh, I would stress that we need to continue to learn about risks and how we manage them and create the systems to adapt uh, over time. And in some, there will be uncertainty, but there's a lot we can do to reduce this <laughs> uncertainty. And we should not be as surprised by biology in the future. Uh, we can't afford to repeat these same mistakes. Thanks. 
Thanks a lot, uh, Megan. Um, so I want to shift gears uh, in my capacity as panelists from uh, the biosecurity realm to geopolitics more broadly and start with a kind of dark historical analogy. Um, many have understandably drawn the analogy between this kind of once in a century pandemic and COVID-19 and uh, uh, the influenza pandemic that swept the globe um, in 1918 and 1919. Uh, but geopolitically, I would contend that the better analogy for the world that we may be entering into is actually the two decades after the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919. That period, which is known as the interwar years, was characterized by rising nationalism and xenophobia, the grinding halt of globalization in favor of beggar thy neighbor policies, and the collapse of the world economy in the Great Depression. Revolution, civil war, and political instability rocked important nations. The world's reigning liberal hegemon, Great Britain, struggled and other democracies buckled, while rising authoritarian states like Germany and Japan sought to aggressively reshape the international order in accordance with their interests and values. Arms races, imperial competition, and territorial aggression culminated in World War II, which is the greatest calamity in modern times. It's also interesting to note that in the United States, the interwar years was also saw the emergence of the America First movement. Hundreds of thousands rallied to the cause of the America First Committee, pressing U.S. leaders to seek the false security of isolationism as the world burned uh, around them. And for those of you who like to watch HBO, the, the plot against America is an alternative history in which the America First uh, movement came to power uh, and the United States stayed out of World War II. Even before COVID-19, a number of scholars were warning that the shadows of the interwar period were starting to reemerge. And, uh, but I would argue that the pandemic seems likely to greatly amplify these forces as, as risks of economic and political upheaval increase, great power rivalry deepens, institutions meant to encourage international cooperation fail, and American leadership falters. It is those dangers which I want to highlight uh, briefly, and my remarks are kind of going to be like a rock skipping across a vast ocean. Um, but if you're interested, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in any one particular thread, I'm happy to dive down into the in the Q and A, or you can look at a recent article I wrote in War uh, on the Rocks, which goes into this stuff in great detail. So the first trend uh, to note is is the trend of globalization and inequality. Uh, the planet has seen unprecedented economic expansion since World War II, and more than anything, that growth has been fueled by globalization. But we also know that globalization has created winners and losers, uh, benefiting the ultra rich and the growing middle classes in emerging markets like China and India but leaving many of the world's poorest people, as well as the working and middle classes and industrialized nations behind. In this, co in this context, I think we can expect COVID-19 to both undermine the economic boon of globalization and to worsen inequality. Uh, the economic disruptions have already been uh, profound and massive and stand poised to increase. Travel and tourism around the world has been shut down. Trade has been disrupted. Global supply chains have been crippled and will likely remain unreliable for months to come. And as countries have gone into self, a kind of self-induced economic coma, factories and businesses have been shuttered and billions of, of people around the world have been forced to stay home, a situation that has led companies to shed jobs at an astounding rate. Just in the past four weeks in the United States, 22 million people have filed for unemployment. The International Monetary Fund now predicts that the global economy will contract by 3% in 2020 the biggest economic downturn since the Great Depression, with a partial recovery in 2021 if the virus is managed to be brought under control. They, the IMF predicts that the United States will contract by almost 6% and the Eurozone will contract by 7.5%, while China will still grow, but only by an anemic 1.2% uh, uh, for the rest of this year. Countries will have vastly different capacities to respond. In advanced industrial countries, trillions of dollars in income support, credit, and loan guarantees may cushion some of the blow, but even wealthy nations will struggle to finance repeated rescue packages. Developing countries, to include many that Steve talked about, will have far fewer options and will also, have, also happen to have comparatively poor health systems, which are at much greater risk of systemic collapse. And for millions of people surviving on the margins, emergency requirements to stay at home and not work could literally prove to be a death sentence. All of these factors promise to worsen inequality, and we're seeing some of that emerge in our own country, and I think we should expect to see more of it around the world. A second trend is political instability and state failure. The virus and the economic disaster it spawns could create new scenarios for political instability. In recent months, places as diverse as Chile, Hong Kong, Iraq, and Lebanon have experienced mass protests over corruption, the lack of services, and government abuses. 
And while COVID-19 for the moment has essentially brought pe gotten people off the street as a consequence of ga large gatherings being banned and people staying at home, it is easy to envision new waves of grievance-based protests and threats to public order in many countries. In many places where people are currently giving their governments the benefit of the doubt, their patience may eventually run out as we've started to see here in the United States in places like Michigan and Ohio in recent days. In numerous places, the collapse of healthcare systems, inadequate economic support, and perceived government mismanagement could drive demonstrations. And in other places, clashes could emerge between the populace and security forces enforcing lockdown orders. In fact, just in the past couple of weeks in Kenya, at least a dozen people have been killed by Kenyan police enforcing dusk to dawn curfews. COVID-19 could also be particularly devastating in existing conflict zones. In Yemen, there's an apparent ceasefire, but in Afghanistan, Libya, Mali, Niger, Somalia, Syria, Ukraine, and other places, combatants and extremists seem to be, see opportunities to exploit distracted foes and violence rages. The UN has warned about the possibly catastrophic consequences on uh, large uh, camps for displaced people and refugees in places like Iraq and Libya, Bangladesh, Kenya, Syria, and other places. And outside of conflict zones, people have warned about the possibility that countries like Iran and Venezuela that are suffering under devastating sanctions, that they could go into total state collapse as a consequence of the uh, coronavirus. Finally, and an issue that's probably worth further investigation, there's significant risks of food insecurity around the world, uh, driven by the fact that the people producing the, agri uh, the, the food are, are getting sick, are forced to stay home, migrant laborers aren't allowed uh, to work, supply chains are, are being uh, disrupted, and it's all, you're already seeing uh, the prices of staple crops uh, uh, increasing significantly, and that could lead uh, to uh, substantial increases in hunger uh, and maybe even famine in some places. A third major trend is displacement. According to the United Nations, the number of international migrants worldwide increased from about 150 million in 2000 to 272 million in 2019. That included 71 million people in 2019 that were either internally displaced or refugees, which is the largest number since World War II. For now, attempts to slow the spread of COVID-19 has actually closed borders and slowed migration, but as the dislocations increase within countries, I think we should expect uh, migration and displacement to increase uh, significantly as people seek better health care, better jobs, a better life. Which leads to a fourth and related trend, which is growing nationalism. I think conditions are ripe in the context of a pandemic and the economic crisis that will follow for mass anger from below and demagoguery from above, supercharged by a digital ecosystem that compounds the dangers of the novel coronavirus with the viral spread of conspiracy theory and disinformation, perhaps along the lines that David suggested. As a consequence, we should expect to see trends toward nationalism, xenophobia, and right-wing populism worsen in some countries. We're already seeing in the United States the Trump administration seeking to blame China and use the crisis to further deny asylum claims for people trying to come to this country. In Hungary, Viktor Orban has blamed foreigners and migration for the spread of the coronavirus there. In Italy, we saw Matteo Salvini's far-right League Party try to use COVID-19 to increase fear of immigrants and and skepticism of the European Union. And, and, uh, you know, and we could see this happen in other countries. Now, it's also the case that the virus itself is an imperfect foil for right-wing populists because it was not created by elites nor by a particular group of outsiders. And because it seems to show actually the need for mainstream political parties who know how to govern. But I suspect that that will change as the focus shifts away from the virus itself to a broader debate about the economic crisis that it has unleashed the future of globalization, growing divisions within uh, entities like the EU, renewed debate about national borders, and, and how to deal with the displacement the crisis creates elsewhere and once again sends people streaming to Europe, North America, and parts of Asia. A fifth trend is democratic backsliding. I'm not gonna talk a lot about this because Larry Diamond talked about it uh, last week and did a great job, um, but I do think it's worth noting that we're already seeing some countries, Hungary being the most notable, uh, using the coronavirus to pass emergency laws that substantially increase the power of the executive. We're also seeing an impact on democracy. I think we should all be heartened by what happened in South Korea the other day, where you had record turnout for an election in the midst of a pandemic. But I think we should be, uh, we should be sober about the fact that outside of South Korea, at least 50 countries and territories around the world have already decided to postpone national and subnational elections due to the pandemic. And I think that we can expect 
executives in some places to seize on election delays to engineer extended tenures and greater power. Um, you're also seeing a crackdown on journalists in places like Bolivia, Hungary, India, and South Africa under the guise of preventing misinformation uh, about, uh, about the virus. And longer term threats may emerge from new uses of digital surveillance. We're seeing in places as diverse as Belgium, South Korea, and Israel, democracy is using tools that were designed to counter terrorism to try to track uh, people who've contracted the virus or, uh, and other people they've come into contact with. And I think there's a real danger that in the aftermath of, of the virus, some of these uh, surveillance regimes uh, will continue to be entrenched at both within states and, and by corporate actors. This, a sixth trend is the resurgence of great power rivalry. Prior to COVID-19, uh, there, there was a lot of talk in Washington about a new Cold War with China. And I think COVID-19 is speeding that up and deepening it. The disparate economic impacts on the US and China and future fiscal constraints could alter the material balance of power between the two. But we're already seeing uh, a deepening soft power competition between Washington and Beijing. Now, by all rights, China should have been on its back foot in terms of soft power, after all, the virus emerged in China. It was covered up by local Communist Party officials. Uh, the regime downplayed uh, the virus and thwarted cooperation with the WHO and with, uh, and with the United States and others. But the Trump administration's much more shambolic response to the virus, coupled with its complete failure to work alongside our allies and lead on this issue, and Trump's flip-flopping on China itself, first praising them and now kind of critiquing them in a hand-fisted way, has provided China all sorts of opportunities to provide assistance to dozens of countries in Europe, Latin America, and Africa, to portray its response as much more effective relative to the incompetence of the United States and some European countries, and to really make lemonade out of coronavirus uh, lemons. I also think we can expect the forces arguing to, to for decoupling, economic decoupling between the United States and China to be strengthened by the virus, especially given the revealed dependencies on pharmaceuticals and medical devices uh, between the United States and China. A final trend that's being exacerbated is the stress on the so-called liberal international order, the institutions that help countries cooperate. Uh, we've seen the group of seven and group of 20 nations struggle. We've seen the UN paralyzed over differences between the United States and China and not being able to raise money. Uh, we see uh, the World Health Organization being politicized and Trump cutting off US funding uh, for that organization. And we see divisions within the European Union that were already in place as a consequence of you know, the financial crisis, followed by the Eurozone crisis, followed by the refugee crisis from Syria, followed by Brexit, et cetera, et cetera, being magnified by the horrible toll that the virus is taking. Two final points. Uh, one is I think that the end of the post, I think we are now at the end of the post 9-11 era. That is whatever we define the future to be, it's not going to be in terms of 9-11, but that that is gonna create its own contestation about how we think about the security environment. On the one hand, I think coronavirus will be used by advocates of a traditional national security frame who want to emphasize state sovereignty and great power competition. On the other hand, you'll have others who argue that the crisis reveals the need to elevate human security and transnational challenges like biosecurity, climate change, AI, and cyber. In fact, I think they will persuasively argue that these challenges are all interrelated. Indeed, climate change could unleash new pandemics and public health risks. And the very steps we are taking to deal with the coronavirus is increasing the surface area, the surface space for cyber attacks. These things are all uh, uh, mingled up together. And obviously David and Megan talked about some of the biosecurity uh, issues. How the US responds in this moment is important. We can decide to lean inward, become more nationalist and more self-help and engage in beggar thy neighbor approaches like we did in the interwar period or we can lean outward, lead, and seek to shape a new international vision as we did after World War II. It's obvious where, what I think we should be doing, uh, but I think to give us a sense uh, for what that would mean in practice, I would like uh, to close out the panel with Brett. Uh, thanks so much, Colin. I will talk just, I'll be very, I'll try to be brief. Um, I do not come at this with a public health background at all. I come at this with a diplomatic background and some experience in building broad coalitions. So I had a piece in Atlantic uh, about a month or so ago about the importance of just the basic elements of diplomacy and building alliances. And what we started to see as this uh, crisis unfolded were just the basic elements of, of governance just uh, atrophying in Washington. 
Um, one of the examples that uh, rung true to me was uh, a desk at state talking to Thailand, um, trying to get PPE from Thailand as USAID was sending PPE, the same equipment to Thailand. That just showed a total breakdown um, in our basic diplomatic um, apparatus with everything being, being quite ad hoc and really no coordinated uh, diplomacy. Um, I have some experience in the past two administrations in the, well, the Bush administration, even in the crisis in Iraq, uh, President Bush led use, using the imprimatur of the United States to set up PEPFAR, which Steve talked about, uh, mobilizing you know, 50 countries, $80 billion, uh, saving uh, 17 million lives. That's something the United States can uniquely do. Uh, the Obama administration, even in the middle of the ISIS crisis, I remember President Obama talking about uh, the Ebola response and mobilizing um, almost 60 countries to help with that. Um, this is America's comparative advantage, building alliances, diplomacy. Uh, it is our comparative advantage in a great power competition. Um, right now in this crisis, I think there seems to be a view in Washington from people I'm talking to, this is a bit of a bump in the road that we're gonna get through this and that our foreign policies will kind of continue um, on the continuum they've been on. So you've seen the administration roll out um, a new proposal in Venezuela about trying to get Maduro out of power. Uh, we started a new military operation, counter -narc narcotics off the coast of Venezuela, uh, continue to talk very tough against Iran. Um, this is really ringing uh, poorly around the world. I'm hearing from a lot of former colleagues just basically asking, uh, where is the United States? So I think, like it or not, we're at a significant uh, inflection point. Um, we have senior envoys. Um, on issues like Syria, on Afghanistan, on Iran. And I think um, it is quite important. And I think as we talk about this publicly to just continue to make the case for uh, diplomacy and leadership and the, the rule book and how to do this is pretty well established. Um, you can appoint a very senior uh, former, uh, former diplomat, former military commander uh, to help coordinate the overall uh, international response. So that's something that I called for in the piece in the Atlantic. Um, I think this is important, even the, the stagecraft of statecraft to show uh, that the United States is trying to fill the vacuum that really exists out there. Um, some things a coalition can do. This is not philanthrop philanthropic. Uh, it helps protect the American people. Um, basically establishing standards for screening at international airports. What is this going to look like uh, as international travel uh, loosens up? testing vaccine trials, mobilization of vaccines, if we ever get to that point, uh, what we used to do with the Soviet Union in the height of the Cold War on uh, small pa smallpox um, and polio. Uh, PPE, I think this will be a real opportunity as our own industrial base really mobilizes as, as it is now uh, to help uh, share and distribute uh, PPE around the world to hotspots, including um, the displacement camps in the Middle East in which this virus could rocket through uh, very quickly, which have then rebound uh, back to us. Uh, so the basic point is just using the um, old school elements of American power, um, which I do not have confidence the Trump administration will do, but I think it's very important for all of us to continue to encourage them uh, to do so, that so we do not uh, get on the road to the, the entropy that Colin, I think, lays out in his very brilliant piece. Um, there has been an echo of this around the world. King Abdullah of Jordan has called for uh, an international alliance calling for American leadership. Um, Gordon Brown gathered 200 former uh, world leaders to call for the same thing, um, but nothing has really been answered uh, from Washington. So again, to get off that slide that Colin, I think very much uh, lies out. I think there is an opportunity, um, but my, um, my confidence uh, is restrained in terms of whether or not we will seize it. Well, on that cheery note, um, let's open it up. Uh, I have questions um, and we'll try to be efficient in answers. Uh, there are a bunch of questions for, for everybody, but Steve, maybe we'll start with you. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of talk uh, in the news because of Trump's cutoff of the World Health Organization, cut off of $400 million. Um, but Steve, I don't know if you have any views. Uh, Mary Steiner asks, what should the role of the WHO be in preventing and, and, uh, and curing pandemics, uh, advancing the global health security agenda, uh, so many of the issues you talked about. Yeah, I think that they're really cru they're crucial. They're absolutely crucial because they have the legitimacy to work all over the world, and and um, this is really um, their their task. The um, difficulty, however, 
is that they are basically a voluntary organization. Um, they can only run to the extent that they are supported. And through the years, it's really been the US government and the Europeans who have given um, enormous amounts of technical support and financial support to the institution. So I do think that they are a crucial um, entity, but they need support. They need support and they really need nation states to be backing them up. Thank you. Uh, um, David, Gabrielle Hecht asks, what are some of the critical bottlenecks in the supply chain now, other than the most obvious ones? And Thomas Finger asks, can we have an effective early detection and tracking capability without a national health insurance program and integrated data program? Right. Um, in many cases, uh, in response to Gabrielle's question, we actually have pretty good um, lead compounds or methods um, or resources that we know would be useful if we had enough of them. So I think one of the critical bottlenecks is the production capability and the agility to um, pivot from producing one version of X to a different version of X. One of the, the approaches that has been you know, touted and I think could be much more fully exploited is the idea of these generic platform technologies that allow you to essentially plug and play. We know how to make a vaccine, for example, against a family of viruses. We don't know which one will face us, but when we learn it, we quickly have the means to plug in the appropriate module and then the distributed manufacturing capability to mass produce the, the needed item. So it's actually in the execution. It's in the ground, you know, the ground um, deployment that, that we're missing and that we should be much better pre uh, pre prepared to do. And to, to the other question, um, I think the answer is no to Tom. Um, it's very hard to coordinate information gathering and then um, exploitation of good information without um, a uniform system. A national health care system would be the obvious solution to that. There may be some other, uh, you know, lesser effective but similar kinds of approaches, but essentially we need a nationalized system that has standardized um, uh, requirements for information and a means for collating and then distributing um, a, a broad uh, situational awareness. Thanks, David. Um, so, Megan, um, Nora Dean Chadi, and apologies if I butchered that name, asked some scientists support the hypothesis of uh, that COVID 19 or SARS CoV 2, uh, it was the byproduct of genetic engineering, um, uh, you know, po possibly you know, in a lab in China. There's also been accusations from China to the United States that it was somehow engineered here. Um, a more plausible hypothesis seems to be that it, it may not have emerged from the wet market, but actually from the Wuhan Institute of Virology through testing on coronaviruses with bats or other things. But like, what? how much credence do you put in any of these hypotheses that the initial explanation, which it, that it came from this wet market in Wuhan might not be right, but instead it could have either been man-made or the result of an accident? Yeah, I think we need to look at um, the, all of these as probabilities, right? And the, the, the largest probability is that this emerged, right, through human animal contact through a variety of different mechanisms of which we will likely never know, right? And then, but we can't fully discount um, that some of the ways that we come in contact with these agents is through the research that we conduct, including you know, getting large numbers of samples from the types of bat populations that are likely to have been an origin, uh, right, for this disease. And, and it, is, it is also likely that we're going to be accumulating evidence for long periods of time that help inform our judgments, and we're going to exist in, in some amount of, of uncertainty. There are different types of evidence that we can use, though. There was a, a paper in Nature, for instance, that, that basically showed there are no attributes of this particular virus that would lead us to believe that it's genetically engineered, right? But I think some of the other uh, uh, events that we've seen here um, see how, like, even despite that, types of evidence, that type of evidence, there are lots of misinformation, disinformation, risk perceptions that are really hard to fudge. Um, so this is not just about the accumulation of facts, it's how in the absence of facts or even in, in spite of them that that's manipulated in, in time. And um, which is one more thing to, to note is that it's not just the, the sort of biological evidence, the biological forensics, but we rely on all different types of intelligence to inform these assessments. And so, you know, we would, you know, be looking for is there 
you know, particular communication that said, oh, there was a, an accident or, or some symptoms, but because we're seeing asymptomatic like, transmission, that's not, that's not necessarily going to exist. So we need to um, also recognize that the next pandemic will probably not look exactly like this. And so we need to not over index in the midst of this uncertainty on any particular origin. Thanks, Megan. Um, Brett, uh, two interrelated questions for you. I mean, obviously, Brett, you've served um, under the past two presidents as the presidential envoy for the uh, coalition to defeat uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Um, Maggie, uh, Maggie Panetta asks, uh, could you share your thoughts on how the virus will affect Syria and Iraq specifically, especially given Syria's fractured governance? And Melissa Carlton um, asks, what types of foreign policies can the U.S. pursue to reduce the likelihood of COVID-19 spreads um, to further destabilize conflict zones uh, like Syria? Um, I think those are great questions. Let me just give you an example of, um, I heard from a very senior um, Iraqi leader actually a couple uh, days ago who said, uh, what's happening here seems beyond the capabilities of the current world order. In crises, people across the world usually come together to solve challenges, but we're seeing the opposite happen here. And um, what you're hearing there is just a lot of anxiety and anxiousness as they don't have a handle on this. Um, in Syria, I know, where we have forces in the northeast part of the country, um, the WHO, we've talked about the WHO, they operate through uh, states. So they work through the Assad regime, whether you like it or not. And it's very difficult uh, to get support that we need in other parts of Syria. So um, I think the risks are enormous. And um, if the pandemic uh, reaches some of these areas, again, it can just rocket through very quickly uh, and get totally out of control. So um, I think the risks are quite high. Um, one thing you have seen in Iraq, uh, there was a, a pretty broad protest movement that had been developing. That has now basically stopped because nobody is in the streets. Um, and the Iraqis are trying to uh, form a new government. So they bought themselves a little bit of time, so we have to see. But I am kind of in the camp where Colin is. I think this is all just exasperating all the pre-existing problems. Um, ISIS and terrorist groups will try to take advantage of it, uh, which is why we need to try to focus on harnessing uh, what we can uh, with, our, with our friends. Uh, I'm sorry, Colin, the second question. Oh, just are there anything, you know, given the, the, the vulnerability of populations in Syria, displaced people, people under siege, fractured communities. Is there anything that we should be thinking about from a US foreign policy perspective in terms of you know, helping those communities at this time? Um, even just being seen as, uh, obviously every country is so focused on their own domestic response, but I think being seen as trying to uh, lead um, to try to set up the basic testing and isolation and the, the standard practices that um, others on the panel have talked about um, would be helpful, um, but we're not really uh, doing that. So um, that, and that opens the door to the Chinese and others to kind of the arsonist fireman approach where they'll come in and kind of buy some goodwill by trying to do, do this. Um, I noticed a Chinese plan, plane landed in Syria a couple days ago and unloaded a bunch of boxes. Um, nobody knows what's in the boxes, but they're using that as their kind of uh, soft power. So um, we have tremendous networks, the USAID and all around the world in Syria, Iraq and the Middle East. And I think we should um, have American flags on things and show that we are here to help. That's what we do as a country. Um, but right now, um, I just, I don't see that happening. But the main point about the, is that the risks are so high in these, these just high population density areas, the displacement camps um, and in these vulnerable spots. And so far we haven't seen it, but that could be because we're not really testing it and don't really know exactly what's happening over. Great. Um, we have a, a number of questions we won't be able to get to, but I'm going to field one from Reed Pauly, um, uh, which touches on, on my remarks. Uh, Reed asks, what kind of fiscal constraints should we expect in the U.S. budget in the years ahead, and how will this impact the defense budget, and will it change anything about the U.S. military's new focus on great power competition? Um, I actually think that the virus and its after effects could have all sorts of implications for military readiness, both directly and indirectly. So, um, directly, uh, the virus itself could have effects on the force. Um, as a historical note, at the height of America's involvement in World War I, influenza and pneumonia sickened 20 to 40 percent of the U.S. Army and Navy uh, personnel. And today, uh, the coronavirus could similarly threaten military readiness if it infects a significant portion of the force, leads to extended cancellation of training and military exercises, which is already happening, 
prevents deployments overseas or disrupts military supply chains. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has already put one of one of the uh, of America's eleven aircraft carriers out of commission, uh, the Theodore uh, Roosevelt, um, and uh, so it could have direct effects. But I think the bigger effects are the ones that Reed's question touches on, which are the budgetary ones. It's hard to know, but I, I, I can anticipate a couple of things. One, when this is all said and done, the United States may have spent something like four trillion dollars to try to keep the economy afloat. Um, that is an extraordinary amount of money, and it will create some significant austerity pressures in future years, regardless of which party is in control in the White House or uh, in the Congress. Um, I think you could expect two types of trade-offs that uh, could affect great power competition. One is actually butter-for-butter trade-offs. That is, while this crisis may elevate the prior, you know, transnational threats like pandemics or climate change or other things, it's also going to starve the resources that might be required to invest in infrastructure, invest in green energy, uh, and uh, invest in more healthcare even, or education systems. So a lot of the things that underwrite national competitiveness great and great power competitiveness could actually be undercut by the austerity it imposed and the butter for butter trade-offs that we could expect. And then of course, there's the guns for butter uh, debate. Currently, uh, you know, the United States spends $700 billion a year on our military. Um, I expect that that number will come down, especially if the Democrats retake the White House, uh, and that a lot of these austerity pressures are going to bite on the Pentagon as well, both because there will be pressing domestic priorities, but also because people will argue that transnational threat threats require us to rethink what it means to have a national security budget, and that we should be spending more money in places like State Department, USAID, USAID CDC, uh, um, Department of Homeland Security, uh, and other uh, entities. And so I, can, I think we can expect that that will also be a, a drag on the military instrument. The last point I will make is that um, I think even if we have a new administration that takes a more internationalist position, I suspect this, this will contribute to a general tendency towards military retrenchment. That is that we shouldn't actually be going around the world ex, ex, uh, spending a lot of blood and treasure to try to fix the world's problems. Either we should come home, which is essentially Trump's argument, or we should lean forward using other tools, such as diplomacy, development, uh, health security assistance, and other things along the lines that we've talked about today. Um, but I, I believe that this debate about how it will play out in the military domain is gonna, is gonna uh, be with us for uh, years to come. Um, apologies for that handful of questions that we left on the cutting room floor, but hopefully uh, you found the comments uh, by our various panelists uh, useful. Um, uh, we certainly appreciated uh, everybody showing up um, and uh, asking such great questions. Um, I think we are not turning it back over to uh, Mike McFall. It's left to me to simply say uh, thanks to all of you and uh, stay safe. <laughs>